What's up everybody? I hope that you guys are having an amazing time so far with your small groups. My day has been going good. It's actually my birthday today as I'm shooting on Thursday and my day is great. It would be a little better if I could wear my hat like this, but the shadow comes down on it. So I got to keep it like this. But anyways, that is besides the point. We are back for our last installment uh, from this day forward, uh, navigating sex and dating God's way. But before we dive in, make some noise if you're excited for The Edge next week. Make some noise if you're excited for our first large group gathering since the new structure has begun. If you are pumped for The Edge, how about y'all prove it and pull out your phone right now? Pull out your phone right now. If I had my phone on me, I would do it and send out a text. Send out a text to a friend that's never been to The Edge, someone who you think that might be interested in coming right now. Seriously, I want over 100 kids as we speak at all these different locations to send out a text and just say, hey, it's gonna be awesome. There's gonna be free pizza, great music, cool people, you know, like, like an after party, no small groups, and a free t-shirt if it's your first time. So come to The Edge. Uh, raise your hand if you actually did that, okay? Awesome, if you're not, I am judging you in my heart. But it's gonna be a really, really good night. We're, we're diving into a series titled Fix Your Eyes and we're gonna talk about social media, how we fix our eyes on social media and maybe some, some ways to, to navigate social media the way that God would want us would want us to. But anyways, we're, we're diving back into the content tonight on sex and dating. First week we talked about sex. Second week we talked about singleness. Last week we talked about like why date, what's the point of dating, and then we also talked about who, like who should we date. And tonight we're talking about when and how. Because here's what I know, a lot of you are thinking, okay, this is great information, but how do I know when I am ready to date? How do I know when I am ready to date? Like, and I just wanna say this, I don't think it's a certain age. Like I'm not gonna get up here and be like, when you're 13, you're ready to date. When you're 16 and can drive, you are emotionally ready to date. Like when you're 18 spiritually, you are all set for a dating relationship. There's no precedence in scripture where it's like a certain age, you know, when you're ready to date. In fact, in scripture, biblical times, a lot of you would be married right now, which is kind of scary to think about. But rather than an age, I really think it's just the way that we structure our lives. I think it's a perspective of how we view spirituality and how we view life and how we view God and really a perspective. And I think if we have this perspective that I'm about to show you, you shouldn't date. And the perspective is if Jesus is just another priority, like on your high priority list, you're not ready to date. If Jesus is just another part of your life, you're not ready to date because that structure is really, really weak. Let me use this illustration right here. Like, you know, let's just say that each block represents a priority. So you have sports, they're important to you. And you have um, I, money, so work, however you do that, chores, that, that's down here. And then you have your social media persona, that's, yeah, that's important, so you have that right here, that's on your priority list. And then you have your grades, that's important, or at least it's important to your parents and it should be for you. And so you have that and, and, and then you have, you know, your friends. Obviously your friends are important, your recreational life, that's important. And then you have dating, your boyfriend or your girlfriend and that's there on your priority list. And then, and then you have your family. And then on top of it all, if you got your life together, you just, fight to keep Jesus at the top. Does that make sense? You just fight to keep Jesus at the top. And, and, and why this is weak is because a lot of times when we just have Jesus as another priority of our life, he's interchangeable, right? And so, so like Jesus can get replaced by dating at times for the top shelf of your priority list. So Jesus gets put there and then dating gets put there. And then at times like family becomes more important than everything. And so dating gets put here and then, and then your family life gets put here. But, but let's just say, even if, even if Jesus is at the top shelf, so let's say we'll have family here, dating here, like and, and you put Jesus at the top shelf of your life, it is a weak 
foundation. Because here's the reality. Some of these things can fall apart at times. You can get a bad grade. Pull that block out. Your dating relationship can end. And look what happens when that happens. Look what happens when dating comes crashing down. Your relationship with Jesus comes with it. And what I've learned is that when your relationship with Jesus comes crashing down, so does everything else. So does everything else. That was pretty, was pretty loud, right? But I think that that is what takes place. And what we learn in scripture is that that Jesus is not just to be a part of your life, but for many of us, I've seen it. Like you get invited by a boyfriend or girlfriend to church and you're there and Jesus, no doubt, is on the priority list, but he's like even with your boyfriend or girlfriend. And so when your boyfriend or girlfriend breaks up with you, you're never at church anymore because Jesus was just another priority on your priority list. So there has to be a better way. Scripture doesn't teach that Jesus is just another part of your life. In fact, in Colossians chapter 3, Paul says, Christ, who is your life? Christ, who is your life? He says in Philippians, for me to live is Christ. In, in Ephesians, he says that he is the chief cornerstone, which leads us to a better way to live, a better perspective, a better structure for our life. And this is Jesus. He should be the foundation. He shouldn't just be another priority on your priority list. List. He should be the foundation that your priority list is built on. So you know what? Family, great. Friends, amazing. Sports, awesome. But you know what? I'm going to build those things on Christ. I am going to honor God with those things. Those things are going to be centered on the teachings of Jesus. Dating, great. Absolutely. We'll put that up there. Uh, we could keep going, social media, whatever it is. But look what happens when dating gets pulled away then. Like maybe something is impacted. Maybe your friendships are impacted because you guys have the same friend group and maybe that comes cool, whatever. But your life does not fall apart. Your relationship with Jesus it not only stays, but it is able to anchor the other things in your life as well. And this is essentially the teaching of Jesus in his famous sermon known as the Sermon on the Mount. He says that when you apply the teachings of Jesus, when you, when you base your life on Christ and the way that he calls you to live, it is, it is like building your life on a rock. When the, when the wind comes, when the streams rise, your life will remain. So in order for you, I think if you're ready to invite someone in your life, if you're trying to figure out when you're ready, I think you need to say, hey, is Jesus just another part of my life? Or is he the foundation that my whole life is built on? I think that's such an important thing to think about. And next, how? How? Maybe you're like, I'm ready. All right, you've talked about how dating is to be a process of evaluation. You've, you've, You've talked about who I should date, but now how should I date? So we're going to kind of talk about some practical advice on maybe how you should date. And the first one is this. You need to be clear. You need to be clear. This is so, this is so important. Guys, she's either your girlfriend or she's not. She's either your girlfriend or she's not. Girls, he's either your boyfriend or he's not. Like far too often when I ask students, far too often in my high school life, if you would ask me what's going on with you and her, I would have been like, ah, we're just kind of talking, just talking. We're, we're, you know, it's complicated. Um, we're just hanging out, which everyone knows what that means, okay? We're just hanging out, yeah, okay. Stop saying that, okay? Like be clear, dudes, if you're gonna date a girl, if you, wanna, if you wanna participate in this process of evaluation saying, hey, is this the person that maybe God has for me? Is this God's best for me? Say, hey, hey, I wanna pursue a relationship with you. I wanna pursue a deeper friendship with you. I want you to be my girlfriend and I wanna honor God and, and I wanna go about it in this way. You need to be clear because Far too often, if you're like, we're just talking and it's great, the other person doesn't think it's great, but they just like you too much to end it. You're just stringing them along. So ladies, if, 
there's a dude that isn't clear and we're just kind of talking and he's leaving you on red and he texts you when he wants to text you and he Snapchats you when he wants to Snapchat you and all these different things and it's just complicated. You have the power to make it less complicated by saying it is over, right? I don't know why I did that, but it just felt good, right? Guys, if a girl's stringing you on and she's being sketchy, say, you know what, it ain't complicated any more. We are done. Y'all need to be clear. And then next, don't be private. Don't be private. There, there is power in numbers. Scripture talks about this. A strand of three cords is not easily broken. Where two or more are gathered, there he is. There's power in the assembly of of, of people, we see this in our, in our, in our God. He's, he's three in one. He's a Trinitarian God, three persons, like one God. That's, that's amazing. There's power in community. And the temptation of dating is that we, we ditch our community and just hang out with one person all the time. We, we push people away, maybe unintentionally, because we're just so captivated by this person by this guy or by this girl and pretty soon it's just you two you're hanging out alone in the basement it's fun but nobody else is there your 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 friendships weaken because you haven't invited them into that and so you need to fight the temptation to be private hang out in groups Hang out in groups. And that makes the process of evaluation a whole lot easier. You can see how they interact with other people. You, you can see if they're really fun to be around. You can see how you gel in social settings. And beyond that, you invite other people into the process of evaluation because love is blinding at times. Dating is blinding at times. And you might think that this person does no wrong, but the people that care most about you, which you need to listen to them in regards to your dating relationship. If you're small group leaders, if you're friends, if your family members are like, hey, this person isn't the right person for you, you should listen to them. But the only way that they can weigh in on it is if you give them if you give them the, 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 the option to, if you let them see this person where they can say, I don't know if they treat you the right way. I don't know if this is the person for you. And maybe you're like, well, I, when do we get to hang out one-on-one? -on -one? I still want to be private. I want to have good conversations. I want to get to know this person. I get that. That's, there's merit in that. But you need to be private in public. You need to be private in public. Go to a park, go to a coffee shop, go to a cool restaurant. Like, be private in public. That takes away a lot of the temptations that come along with dating. Next, be cool. Like, be cool. Like, like and he, this might be offensive to some of you, but I'm just gonna offend you. Like, don't, don't tell the person you're dating that you love them a couple weeks in, a couple months in even. Like, that's weird. Don't, don't get on Instagram and, and, and and put them in your bio with their name and the date that you start dating them in a heart by it. That's a little weird. Like, don't get on Snapchat and, and post love of my life with a picture of them after a month of dating. If the other person isn't weird, they're gonna be a little freaked out by that. And some of y'all are like, well, I do that and I'm offended. Good, I love you. That's why we're talking about it. Just stay cool. Y'all are young. Don't, uh, like, they're the love of my life. You have a lot of life left and there's a chance that you're gonna have more loves of your life. And so please, just like, relax a little bit. Next, save sexual activity till marriage. The hooking up, the hand stuff, the getting under blankets and doing whatever, Netflix and chill, like the intense makeout sessions, the, the, the experimenting sexually, it's not worth it. It brings a lot, a lot, a lot of pain. Sex is powerful, it's emotional, it's spiritual, it's binding. We learned about that the first week and you need to save it. Jesus says that anything, anything that causes you to lust, over another human being, run as fast as you can away from it. Do whatever it takes to get that out of your life. Paul says flee from sexual immorality. And there are a lot of reasons why we talked about those the first week, but kind of going off of last week, it clouds your judgment. It jacks up the process of evaluation. I've seen a lot of relationships where everything is horrible, but they're hooking up. And hooking up is powerful and it's binding and it's kind of fun. So people stay together for months and everything is brutal other than that one aspect of their relationship, but it's blinding and it's powerful. So you need to fight the temptation and you need to save sexual activity till marriage. But that doesn't just happen by accident. 
It doesn't. You need to set strong sexual boundaries. If you want to do this right, you need to set strong boundaries. In other words, here's what I mean by this. If you're like, you know what, I'm just not going to do it. But we're going to, we're going to, we're going to like go down in the basement by ourselves. But we're never going to hook up. I, it's, it's too late. It's, it's bad thinking. Y'all know the feeling if you're about to hook up, like it's, it's, it's crazy. It feels like there's magic in the air and your home hormones are going everywhere and it's a lot of fun. And, and, and so you're down in the basement and if, 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 you're, if you're at that moment, if you're like, oh my gosh, I'm just, it's too late. It's too late. If you're, if you're in the car alone with somebody at night and you're like, you're planning your, 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 your move to go in for the kiss, it's, it's too late. You've set yourself up for failure. You need to eliminate the moment that leads to the moment. If you struggle with pornography and, 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 and you're in your room and you come across a really cute picture on Instagram that causes you to think about the opposite sex in a way that you shouldn't, it's too late. You've set yourself up for failure. And so here's some strong sexual boundaries that I've thought about. You guys can talk more about them, but no bedrooms with your, with your boyfriend or girlfriend. That should be obvious, but it's not for a lot of us. No basements. No, no kissing, set the, set the bar high. Feet on the floor at all times. <laughs> Hands above blankets. No phones in the room at night. It's, I'm not trying to be some legalistic nut job. I'm just trying to set you up for success. It doesn't just happen by accident. If you don't set strong external boundaries, it's not going to happen. But also you need to be soft on yourself internally. You need to be soft internally. And here's what I know. For a lot of us in a series like this, you've blown it. Maybe you're a leader in the room. Maybe you're a middle school in the room. Maybe you're a high school in the room. And you're like, I've blown it. I've jacked up when it comes to dating. I've gone too far sexually. I've hurt people of the opposite sex by not being clear. I've led people on. I've had, I've had bad relationship after bad relationship. I am almost too far gone when it comes to this whole navigating sex and dating God's way. You need to understand that Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. You need to allow his grace to cover the shame in your life that goes along with these topics and understand that his grace does not just have the power to forgive you, but it has the power to change you and set you on a brand new course sexually. And that's the hope for this series, that from this day forward, from today, today, Sunday evening, whatever date it is, I don't know, it, like March, early March, we're gonna navigate sex and dating God's way. We hope you have great discussion and we will see you next week at Oak Bridge for the Edge.